so thanks, uh, John and Anna, to, uh, for, for inviting me to this conference um, and to, to speak here. It's a real honor. Um, and um, I wanted to see, uh, um, I look forward to t talking to you about, about the work that, that we've been doing. Um, so the thesis of my talk is that um, the ancient DNA revolution that's really unfolded very rapidly, I think over really the last seven years, um, is a transformative thing for archaeology. It's transformative in the way that the radiocarbon revolution was transformative when Willard Libby invented radiocarbon dating 49 years ago. It really transformed archaeology by setting a time scale, by uh, allowing an accurate chronology for, um, for, 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 for archaeology. In the same way, I think ancient DNA is transformative and offers the chance to see how ancient peoples and plants and uh, animals relate to each other. Um, so the talk is going to have two examples. The first example is unpublished work um, about an early modern human from Romania um, who the genetic data shows has a recent Neanderthal ancestor as an example of uh, some, one of the things one can find with ancient DNA. And the second part of the talk is about very recently published work, two papers, um, two or three papers, um, showing that present-day Europeans are the result of mixture of three ancestral populations which came together over the last 9,000 years in convulsive mixture events that have produced the present-day populations of Europe. So the first part of this talk um, is about an early modern human from Romania who has a recent Neanderthal ancestor. Um, and this is work that's led by Svante Pabo uh, in the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig that worked on also with uh, here Matthias Meyer and others in Leipzig. Uh, and Xiaomei Fu, who is a graduated student and postdoc in Leipzig, who's now been a postdoc in our laboratory, too, working on this. Um, so this is a um, lower jaw from Owasa Cave. I don't know why Owasa didn't come out. Um, the radiocarbon date is between 37 to 42,000 years ago. So modern humans, people who anatomically look like us, only begin to appear in Europe beginning about 45,000 years ago. So this is one of the earliest modern human skeletons in Europe and, uh, and it's a, uh, a, jaw, a lower jawbone that is, um, that, is, uh, that is found in the cave without any cultural context, but it's very old. And the morphology, as it was interpreted by Eric Trinkhaus, is that its morphology is that of a modern human, but it has some archaic aspects. And Eric Trinkhaus argued that this might be the, uh, uh, an individual who is from a hybrid population, which had some Neanderthal ancestry. So um, when we uh, did this ancient DNA work, and I'm not going to talk in detail about how the ancient DNA work was done, because I think I don't have time, and Matthias may talk more about related things. Um, the Owasa sample is one of the most difficult samples that I know of in ancient DNA research. So uh, when one makes a next generation sequencing library out of a bit of powder taken from this lower jawbone, take a little powder, extract the, D extract the DNA from it, make a next generation sequence library, or in this case, five next generation sequencing libraries, and you sequence it, only one out of every 500 molecules aligns to the human genome. The rest don't align to the human genome because they're microbial. They come from bacteria or fungi or other organisms. Um, and then when you look at the sequences that align and look at the consensus sequence of the mitochondrial DNA, which is the uh, DNA you get from your mother and your mother's mother's mother and your mother's mother's mother, the consensus sequence is that of a typical present-day European. And when we were analyzing the data, initially we thought this is a contaminating individual, a uh, contaminated sample that was handled by archaeologists and lab people and was contaminated by a present-day European. Um, but ancient DNA has a characteristic feature that at the ends of molecules, um, the cytosines, you have four nucleotides in DNA, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. The cytosines in ancient DNA are changed to uracils, which are read often by, as thymines by the sequencer. So by restricting this analysis of the mitochondrial DNA to places where almost everybody in the world has a cytosine, but where this sample had a thymine, what actually happened is that the consensus of the mitochondrial sequences was totally different. And what was happening is there was a minority population of molecules, about a third of the molecules in the sequencing that we were doing, that were from a completely different individual than the majority who was a contaminant, and correspond to a mitochondrial DNA that had never been seen before, that was an early split from the radiation of Eurasian populations, consistent with what one might expect from the radiocarbon date of about 40,000 years ago. So as I mentioned, uh, ancient DNA has the C to T change, and if you look at the consensus uh, sequence, it looks like a typical present-day European clustering with one European French person to the exclusion of a European English person. 
When you look at the consensus, it falls at the base of this large group of present-day Eurasians. Um, so this was very exciting um, and suggested to us that we might have genuine ancient DNA in hand if we restricted to the small subset of molecules that had a thymine instead of a cytosine at the ends of the molecules, which is a characteristic of ancient DNA. So this is a really bad sample, but by working very hard, we can extract a little bit of useful data from it. So what we did is we tried to extract useful data from it. Um, in Leipzig, people made five different DNA sequencing libraries, which are what one takes is a bit of bone powder, turn, extracts DNA out of it, if there's any DNA at all, and puts it in a form that can be sequenced by one of these next generation sequencers that can produce hundreds of millions of sequences for a few thousand dollars in a day. Um, and what we did is we enriched those libraries, which as I mentioned before are only one 500th human, we enriched them for um, uh, a total of 3.7 million positions in the genome that we know are variable amongst people. Because we worked very hard to produce many libraries from this sample, we were able to get data from OASA, this sample, covering a total of 1.7 million of these 3.7 million targeted positions that also had these cytosine to thymine changes that meant that the sample was probably only a few percent contaminated after this restriction. So we had usable data from this sample, and when we had, once we had this usable data, we could ask a very simple question. We could ask, is this sample OASA 1, is it more closely related to a European sample we have today or an East, uh, an East Asian sample or a Native American sample? So this is a cartoon of a chromosome. So you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. This is supposed to be the centromere of the chromosome in this cartoon. And so what you do is you line up the chromosome from a European person and the East Asian person. You look at the very rare positions that differ between people, so only one out of a thousand places in the genome differ on average, but you, the genome's big, three billion bases, so there's millions of base pairs that differ. So you look at a place where some people have a thymine and some people have a guanine, and then you lift the veil on the OASA sequence and say, does it have a thymine or does it have a guanine? And it should be about equally often thymine or guanine if the OASA sample is from a population that's separated from the ancestors of Europeans and East Asians before they separated from each other, because in that case, all the differences between these groups will have arisen since the split from the Owasa lineage. It's a very simple test. It's the same test that we used a few years ago to document that Neanderthals are more closely related to non-Africans than to Africans, which reflects a history of gene flow from Neanderthals into the non-Africans. So we applied it here to Owasa. So when you do this test, the expectation is they should match equally often Europeans and East Asians, but in fact, OASA, a sample from Romania, which is in Europe, matches East Asians more often. It's a um, statistical signal that's seven standard errors from zero. That's a very significant observation. It's, about the, it's above the threshold that, for example, is used for calling the Higgs boson a real fundamental particle, for example. <laughs> and so that's true, both comparing Europeans to East Asians and Europeans to Native Americans, and that's a real surprise because this sample is from Europe. If it was a European and there was genetic continuity in Europe, you would expect it to be attracted to Europeans. On the other hand, when you compare uh, any ancient uh, Europeans, like this is a sample called Kostenki, which is a 36 to 39,000 uh, year old sample from a little bit further east and is slightly more recent, or Lashbor, an 8,000 year old European sample from Luxembourg, or Ustishim, a sample from, uh, east, from Western Asia on the other side of the Ural Mountains in Siberia, all old samples, 8,000 years to 45,000 years, they're all equally closely related, Owasa is symmetrically related to them. So there's something special about present-day Europeans that makes them more distant, but all the other Eurasian samples we looked at are all equally close to Owasa. Um, and so this is very interesting. Um, and it indicates no evidence of genetic particular close relatedness to present-day Europeans. So the reason for this, we think, is something that I will tell you about in the second part of my talk, but for, I, I, I thought it would be better to present the work in this order, even though this one slide might be a bit hard to get until you hear the second part of the talk. So there's a merging model from genetic data that's of the following nature. If you look at a kind of tree to represent human population history, as you, many of you may have heard, geneticists think that the first splits of human populations are those that occurred in Africa, and there's a lineage that went out of Africa and diversified into all the non-African populations that existed in the past of modern humans as well as today. So that's represented in this model by the first split being Africans. 
So the model that we think fits our data is that there's a quadrifurcation, four populations splitting off all at about the same time whose order we can't tell with the current data. Probably it's not exactly at the same time, but it's close enough we can't tell. Owasa split off very early, and it split off possibly before the separation of East Asians and Upper Paleolithic Europeans, like this Kostenki sample I told about, and this Ustishim is also like Owasa in being from this first split. But also we now know that there's actually a very ancient lineage that present-day in, present Near Easterns and Europeans. It comprises about half the ancestry of the first farmers of Europe. And we call them the Basal Eurasians because they're the first lineage outside of, um, uh, 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 in, amongst non-African lineages to split off and then mix back into Europe. And that's what's causing them to be more distant related to Owasa than these population samples are. But what this is telling you is that Owasa, which is a European sample, does not look particularly European. And what this phenomenon I was telling you about before is a, thing, is a feature that's specific to Europeans. It's not telling you about Owasa. So the first result is that Owasa has no evidence of a contribution to later Europeans. So this is very important to contrast with this other sample I told you about, which is Kostenki. It's only a few thousand years more recent, at 36 to 39,000 years ago. Um, and you can test with the same approach I told you about before, where you test another sample, and instead of Owasa, you use Kostenki, and say, is it closer to present-day Europeans or to East Asians? And when you do that, these are the results for uh, Owasa, um, and these are comparisons of all groups except for Europeans. Remember, Owasa is not more closely related to one non-African population than another after you exclude Europeans, but Kostenki is consistently more closely related to uh, European populations or European-related populations, one after the other. So Kostenki, only a few thousand years after Owasa, already has some of the genetic features that are typical of Europeans, whereas Owasa doesn't. So that's sort of a first observation about the sample, which is very interesting because one model you might have in your head is that modern humans get to Europe beginning 45 or 43,000 years ago. People Europe, and it's that population that gives rise to the indigenous hunter-gatherers of Europe, Europe. But Owasa is in that population, and it does not seem to contribute much to the later people of Europe. There seems to be a later population replacement of people like Kostenki that is really the one that's continuous. So this is a novel finding, and it suggests that there might have been an initial Upper Paleolithic occupation of Europe that went extinct somehow or died out with a later migration after at around the date of Kostenki or before that gives rise to a population that does contribute. Kostenki is potentially what's called an Aurignacian sample, but Owasa is probably too early for that. And perhaps this is evidence that the Aurignacian uh, is continuous with later European hunter-gatherers, but this initial Upper Paleolithic population of which Owasa was a member might not have been. So result two is another result, which is that we can do this test where we test is Neanderthal more closely related to Owasa and any other sample. So we want to do this test. And in the Leipzig lab in Germany with Svante Pebo and others, uh, uh, I've been involved in this work. There's been sequencing of archaic humans, Neanderthals, who date to between 39 and 70 or so thousand years, the ones that have been sequenced. So we used one of these high quality genomes recently published to ask, is it more closely related to Owasa or another sample? And what we see is a surprise. It's more closely related to Owasa for every comparison we do, not just to Africans, but to Europeans, to East Asians, to everybody. And if you estimate using the techniques developed for the Neanderthal studies what the proportion of Neanderthal ancestry is in Owasa, you can do it a number of ways. But the estimates are all consistently much higher than any other population and range perhaps from 6 to 9% Neanderthal ancestry, whereas today, non-Africans all have perhaps 2%. So this is an individual with an unprecedented amount of Neanderthal ancestry, and there's no way this can be due to contamination because no person today has that much Neanderthal ancestry um, who could potentially contaminate it. So the next question we wanted to ask is what is the date of the interbreeding in the history of the Owasa sample? The sample is 37 to 42,000 years ago. Um, Eric Trinkhaus thought it actually might be from a hybrid population. Um, and um, it's close in time to the potential date of Neanderthal interbreeding with which other methods people have tended to estimate, including us, was between 50 to 60,000 years ago. So what about this sample? How close was it to the Neanderthal interbreeding? Well, one way you can do this is to use the scale of the size of regions that derive from Neanderthal. So let me unpack that for a minute. So if, you, if I produce a sperm or a woman produces an egg, my sperm is a mixture of the DNA of my mother and father. So what I take is perhaps the first third of my chromosome that I send to my kid, the chromosome one, 
is from my mother and the next two thirds from my, from my dad and there'll be a recombination event which is the join between the bits I sent to my mom and my dad. So every chromosome breaks up once or twice per chromosome per generation and after five or six generations what you have is these chopped up chromosomes that are a mixture of all of your ancestry. So you have a mosaic of chunks from your ancestors that get smaller and smaller one or two chops per generation. So what we did is we looked at 78,000 positions in the genome which are likely to be diagnostic for Neanderthal ancestry. The way we find these sections is we look for places in the genome where all Africans in a large panel of people from Nigeria all have one genetic variant like a cytosine and the Neanderthal that samples that we have all have a thymine for example. So it's places where the Neanderthal we have has a mutation um, that's never seen in sub-Saharan Africans. So these are variants that might likely come from Neanderthals and from statistical analysis we think the great majority of them really derive from Neanderthals when you see them. So when we look at these 78,000 variants and we paint a chromosome according to where they occur, I'm going to walk you through this figure. This is six present day, six individuals. This is a Dinka individual from Sudan. It's a sub-Saharan African and you see a red tick mark wherever there's one of these variants that matches Neanderthals. You see there are very few of them and I believe there's little or no real Neanderthal ancestry in the sample. This is probably noise due to the fact that these sites we're looking at are not perfect and some of them really aren't from Neanderthals. In the French individual you see many more of them and that's reflecting real Neanderthal segments in excess of what you see in the noise measured in Dinka. In the Han Chinese you also see a, 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 about what you see in the French maybe a little more. And in Kastenki and Ustishin you also see them although they tend to be in larger chunks. But in Owasa you see a chunk that's about a half or a third of the size of the whole chromosome. It's what you expect to see if the chromosome is only shattered for a few generations. Here's the whole genome, all 22 nuclear autosomes and you see many of these huge chunks um, and these huge chunks uh, if you do some little trivial statistical modeling to see how many generations of time would have had to pass for, since the Neanderthal ancestor for the chunks to be retained as large as they are, the answer is very precise. It says between four to six generations. So this individual has a Neanderthal directly in their ancestry within four to six generations. You can learn this from the genetic data. We're so lucky to find this individual. We of course know that Neanderthals are in our ancestry from the work of the last few years, but we've caught one very close to when it happened. Um, so the conclusions of this first part of the talk are that this is an individual that we got lucky to find, that they have a Neanderthal ancestor four to six generations back. Um, it's from a population that is an initial upper paleolithic population, modern human population in Europe that didn't seem to have contributed much to later Europeans, implying waves of early human occupation of Europe that were then replaced by later movements that actually did contribute to later people. Um, and um, one thing that's interesting is that this Neanderthal mixture probably occurred in Europe itself. Um, our previous work was consistent with perhaps all the mixture occurring in the Near East and spreading from there both to Europe and to East Asia, even though we, Neanderthal, Europe is the homeland of the Neanderthals, but we now know it's likely that the mixture also happened in Europe itself, although of course, you know, maybe, maybe it happened in the Near East and this person's ancestors in the last four to six generations migrated. So that's the first part of my talk. So the second part of my talk, um, I'm going to tell you about evidence for three very divergent ancestral populations in the ancestry of present day Europeans. This is a collaboration with um, a group in Adelaide um, of which uh, where Alan leads the lab and Wolfgang Hock was our main collaborator there um, and uh, Kurt Alt and Johannes Krause uh, in, 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 um, in, in different parts of Europe um, and people in our group. So I'm going to start by presenting two cultural phenomena revealed by archaeology and linguistics. So one is the distribution of Indo-European languages. So we here are speaking an Indo-European language which is English. Uh, almost every language in Europe with a few exceptions is an Indo-European language which is closely related to languages spoken in Iran and India but there's a big gap in the Near East where people don't speak Indo-European languages for the most part and for the most part haven't spoken it for the last 5,000 years. We know that because writing was invented in the Near East and we know that those languages weren't Indo-European. So how did this crazy distribution of Indo-European languages crossing vast territory and very different places get to be the way it is today. That's one question which clearly reflects cultural diffusion or some kind of shared culture. How did that come to be? Is it due to cultural dispersal and diffusion or is it due to people moving to produce that distribution? Number two, 
spread of farming in Europe. So farming is invented in the Near East, uh, maybe 10 or 11 or 12,000 years ago. It then spreads into Europe beginning 8,500 years ago from Anatolia or from Cyprus uh, and begins in, in, in Greece and then expands within 1,000 years along the shores of the Mediterranean along one route, the Cardioware Neolithic, and along the other route, the Danubian, to become the linear band ceramic. And by 6,000 years ago, it's already in Britain and Sweden. It's a very important transformation. It's documented by the archaeology that this is a profound transformation. The question in both of these cases is, uh, are, these, are these transformations of material culture or language accompanied by movements of people? And there's a sort of ongoing and important debate about that topic. So the genetics is relevant to that because it can document whether there are population movements, something that's not possible with linguistics, which is about language, and something that's not possible by studying of artifacts, which is about cultural transmission. So um, the last decade, ancient DNA has been very important to documenting and helping to begin to resolve the question of whether major migrations occurred to contribute to present day structure of European populations. Already by 10 years ago, ancient DNA had be already become very important based on mitochondrial DNA. So people had already done mitochondrial work on ancient Europeans before and after the transition to agriculture, before 8,500 years ago or before 8,000 years ago and after 8,000 years ago, and had found that mitochondrially, this DNA sequence you get from your mother and your mother's mother's mother, almost all the samples looked at before 8,000 years ago were of these haplogroups types called U4 and U5 in the jargon of that field. And after that time, those had disappeared, basically. So there's a total shift in the maternal ancestry of the population mitochondrially, which was interpreted, uh, I think, convincingly by the ancient DNA specialist and I think accepted by the community as a, um, as a um, population replacement by people bringing new haplogroups in uh, uh, associated with farming. Um, beginning in 2012, people began to look at the whole genome. The whole genome is much bigger than the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is only 15,000 base pairs long. The nuclear genome only contains one's, one's history, one's mother's 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 mother, whereas there's other histories that you have, your mother's mother's father, your father's father's mother. There's actually hundreds of thousands of independent histories going back in time. So there's a lot more information encoded in the uh, nuclear genome. And what was done in this very important paper in 2012 by Ponta Skoglund et al. and was to uh, show, was to get whole genome nuclear data from two groups of samples from Sweden. So there's these people who have an archaeological type called the pitted ware, who are hunters and gatherers on the shorelines of Sweden. And there's, they're living side by side by the funnel beaker people of Sweden. For a thousand years in Sweden, there was arguments about how they were related to each other. Maybe the pitted ware hunter gatherers are just kind of people who started hunting gathering and really are from the farmer population, but they genetically showed they were extremely different from each other, even though they were look, living side by side, almost as different as Europeans and East Asians are today. So like extremely different populations living side by side in Europe 5,000 years ago. And they wrote down a model that Europeans today might be a mixture of lineages relating to these two ancient groups. And here's the mixture proportions with the ones related to farmers, higher frequency in the south, and especially high frequency in Sardinia, and the ones related to the hunter-gatherer in white here in the, uh, the, the um, more common in the north. That was their model. However, um, in the same year, we were involved in analysis not of ancient DNA, but of modern DNA, which was very perplexing in light of that other model. So what we did is the following. So what we developed was a statistical test, which we call the three population test. So the three population test works as follows. So what we do is we look at hundreds of thousands of positions in the genome that are variable in people. So as I mentioned, there's millions of these positions. So we look at a set of hundreds of thousands that are studied in um, using an efficient technology in thousands of people. And so what we do is we take um, a population, for example, the French, French people from, from Europe, and we ask, how is the freq what do the frequencies of the French look like compared to two comparison populations? So um, if the population is mixed, the French individual is mixed of two other populations, its frequencies at genetic variance, you know, some people have 30% of people have the adenine and 70% of people have the cytosine, and that's what I mean by the frequency. If they're mixed, the French will have a, tend to have a frequency intermediate between the two populations that are related to the ones that's mixed. That's a prediction. So um, there's no other way that the frequency will be expected to be intermediate. You can show that mathematically. So if you see a significantly negative z-score, 
um, that tells you that this French population is mixed with populations that are related, perhaps anciently, to these other two populations. So what we did is for each population, the French and then each other population in our data set, we cycled over all other possible pairs of populations, looking to see which pair produced the strongest statistic of mixture. And for the French, we maximized it with the following statistic. One of those populations was Sardinian, an isolated population in an island off southern Europe in the Mediterranean. That's perhaps not so surprising. Maybe that represents an ancient strain of southern European variation related to Near Easterners, maybe bringing agriculture. But the other one is a crazy result. The other population is Native Americans from Brazil. And they're the strongest signal in the whole study. They're stronger than East Asians. They're stronger than present-day Siberians. They're stronger than Near Easterners. They're stronger than Northern Europeans. They're stronger than New Guineans. They're stronger than Australians. It's the strongest signal by far. And the only interpretation of this that's possible is that people in Europe today are a mixture of ancient populations related to present-day Sardinians and present-day, of all people, Native Americans. So what we predicted was the following, that of course we didn't think people got onto boats from the Amazon and they got, went to Europe, because it's not just seen in the, in the um, Amazonians, it's also seen in Mexican Native Americans and North American Native Americans. It's not just seen in Sardinians, it's seen in other Southern European populations. It's a general signal of Native Americans, a general signal of Southern Europeans. So what we proposed instead is that there's an ancient population of Eurasia that splits into the ancient group that gives rise to people in the Near East who eventually then give rise to Sardinians when they come into Europe with agriculture, and another group which we call the ancient North Eurasian. So the ancient North Eurasian is our hypothesized ancient population that lives somewhere in North Eurasia, maybe somewhere in Siberia, maybe somewhere in Eastern Europe, I don't know where, but somewhere, um, and then gives rise to an ancient population that migrates east across the Bering Land Bridge mix, and then contributes to Native Americans and also migrates west to Europe at some point and contributes to Europeans explaining the data. So we proposed what we call a ghost population, a population that's not sampled, but that's reconstructed statistically from the genetic data. So in 2014, a very important thing happened. This paper by Raghavan Skogland and colleagues, not our paper, uh, studies a 24,000-year-old sample from Lake Baikal in Siberia, and it's exactly this population. So they find this ghost population. And if they measure the genetic affinity as measured by the shared genetic frequencies of this population, Malta, MA1, to these populations elsewhere in the world, you see it's blue, it's cold here. Present-day Siberians who live near the sample have almost no ancestry from populations like this one that lived there 24,000 years ago, and one that also lived in the same place 8,000 or 7,000 years later that's genetically very similar to it. So the present-day indigenous Siberians of this part of Siberia are actually a replacement population that come to this region later and replace whoever was there before who looked genetically like this. But these people didn't go extinct. They contributed, um, we think, a third of the ancestry of Native Americans, probably mis mixing with East Asian lineage before crossing the Bering Land Bridge, and a large proportion of the ancestry of Europeans. So this population, different, uh, you know, um, not, instead of going extinct, in fact, has contributed effectively hundreds of millions of people today, and is a completely unrecognized major population of Eurasia that's reconstructed from the genetic data. So it's a very important observation in this paper. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about ancient DNA analysis. You'll hear about this more in the upcoming talks. I'll just briefly talk about how ancient DNA analysis is done. These are, I think, are a series of bones. Matthias, correct me if I'm wrong, from the Neanderthal Genome Project. Um, that were screened for the 2010 project. So you, what's done is typically screening a large numbers of bones, um, making powder in a clean room um, under clean conditions. Um, this is drilling beneath the surface of the bone. Probably Matthias is perhaps that person or recognizes who these people are. Um, and uh, drills beneath the surface of the bone in a borehole to try to get beneath the surface where there might be more contamination. Takes some powder, extracts the DNA from the powder, um, and then uh, sequences it in a modern next generation sequencer. So that's a kind of crude summary of what's done in ancient DNA analysis. So um, in work that, where this work was done in uh, Germany, both in Leipzig and in Tübingen in collaboration with Johannes Krause, we studied DNA from nine ancient European samples, um, eight hunter gatherers from 8,000 years ago, seven of them from Motala in Sweden, um, a, all from the same site. One uh, from Lashbor in, in Luxembourg, where we obtained a high-quality genome from an 8,000-year-old hunter-gatherer, and one uh, a farmer from uh, the linear band ceramic from Europe from 7,000 years ago. Um, so we obtained high-quality genomes from these two samples, and we tried to put them in the context of present-day Europeans. 
So OK, I'm going to walk you through this slide. So this is principal components analysis of 777 present-day Euro, uh, West Eurasians. So this is part of a larger data set of about 2,500 people that we've studied who are present-day people. So the little dots, each one is an individual, and the data is of the following nature. So this is seven, you should think of the data as 777 columns corresponding to all of the samples and about 600,000 rows corresponding to all of the positions in the genome we queried. Inside the table are one of three numbers, 0, 1, or 2, depending on whether you have 0, 1, or 2 copies of the variant that's variable at the site. So if you're in, it's an adenine cytosine variant, you might have the adenine, two copies of adenine, both from your mother and father, that would be 0, or adenine cytosine would be 1 because you would have one copy of cytosine, or cytosine and cytosine, that would be two. That's the data. So what we do is we take that matrix of 777 by 600,000, and we multiply it by, self, by itself to see how distant each sample is from itself. So we're left by a, with a 777 by 777 matrix, and then we uh, tell a computer to cluster the samples or to put, uh, try to explain the most variation in the samples um, along the first axis of genetic variation. So what you might see here is, 0.1 times the value of SNP1 of site 1 minus 0.3 times the value of SNP site 2, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a second dimension. So when you do this on the data and then color the samples by where they come from, but that was not used in the analysis, you see an amazing picture. So here's the picture. This is 777 Europeans and Near Easterners. And what you see is they fall into two parallel lines with almost nothing in between. So one, line 1 is here is the, uh, sorry. Line one over here is the Near East, um, and uh, it's lined in a north-south direction. Uh, here's Arabian and southern Near Eastern populations like Bedouin. On the top are populations from the Caucasus. And here is Europe. Um, there are no European populations in this group. Here's Sardinians and other southern European populations, and here's northeast European populations, and there's a gradient in between. The few populations in the middle are populations like Jewish populations and a few Mediterranean populations, which we think perhaps historically have evidence of later contact between Europe and the Near East. But there's a gap that's potentially significant of a genetic element present in Europeans that's absent of the Near East. So that's what we see. If you look at the genetic data from the ancient samples, you see the following. So Lashbor, this hunter-gatherer, falls beyond Europe in the direction of European separation from the Near East which is a really amazing result because what that's telling you is that present-day Europeans are a mixture of ancestry that's related to this, but no, no present-day European has as much as Lashbor did. So there's no population that has as much as this did. Stuttgart, this farmer from north from Germany 7,000 years ago, falls at the south end of the European gradient and does not look like the present-day Europe Near East. They already look European in this sense, and they come closest to Sardinians. Um, and this ancient 24,000-year-old Siberian is the, as is the top end. So you see one axis of variation corresponding to the difference between Europe and the Near East, of which this hunter-gatherer from Luxembourg is the most extreme, and the other axis corresponding to uh, the difference between this um, ancient North Eurasian sample and early European farmers. So this is just qualitative and hand-wavy, so I want to take you through the actual analysis that we did to actually try to figure out what's actually going on. So if you... We tried to build a model that relates these samples to each other. So this is this 24,000-year-old Siberian, and this model fits the data. So Mbuti are a pygmy population from uh, sub-Saharan Africa that we use as an outgroup that we assume is symmetrically related to all the non-African populations today. The Andamani sample from Ongi are an eastern non-African population that we are using as a potential um, outgroup to the West Eurasian-related groups. Um, we could have used Chinese here instead. And here's Malta and uh, these hunter-gatherers from Europe 8,000 years ago. So the model is that these two groups descend from a common ancestral population that separated earlier from this group. And we can test that the same way that we did with Owasa. You test this East Asian group like Andamanese. Is it closer to Malta or to Lashbor? It should be equally close, and it is. So that works, this model, as far as we can tell. The next thing we do is we put a Native American population to this model, and you do that same test. And the Native Americans are closer to the ancient North Eurasian sample from 24,000 years ago than they are to this sample, as would be expected by a mixture event like this. And they're also ex this sample is closer to Native Americans than are Eastern non-Africans like this, as again would be expected by a model like this. So the third thing that we find is the following. So if you take the far far farmer from Europe, 
it's not a simple sister group to hunter-gatherers from Europe as we perhaps expected that it would be. Um, instead, it gets attracted out that Native Americans are closer to these ancient North Eurasians, uh, sorry, that uh, Eastern non-Africans like the Andamanese are closer to these hunter-gatherers than are Europeans. The only way that can happen um, is if there is a component of ancestry in Europeans that separated from all the other groups before they separated from each other. Um, so this is this early basal Eurasian split. Okay, so um, I, we, and then Europeans today are a mixture of these several lineages in this model. Uh, the ancient North Eurasian, the farmer-related ancestry, and the hunter-gatherer-related ancestry. So under this model, we can get mixture proportions. People in Europe today range from as little as very little uh, uh, ancient North Eurasian ancestry in Sardinians, perhaps none or very little, uh, to up to 18%. Uh, the biggest component is 30 to 90% in the Eastern farmer, and about up to half or zero to half from these indigenous uh, hunter-gatherers. So this is the model that we come up with the data. So what's very interesting about this, this is the first half of the second part of my talk, is that what you actually see in Europe today is a mixture of three very different populations. These populations are genetically as different from each other almost as Europeans and East Asians are from each other. So these are quite profoundly different populations that have mixed into present day Europeans today. But if you look at the first farmers and the first hunter-gatherers of Europe, um, the ancient North Eurasian ancestry isn't there yet, because if you look at the LBK farmer and you look at the hunter-gatherers, it's not there yet. So when did it come in? So the next thing we wanted to do was to say, when did this major ancestral component of Europe come in? So that's what I'm going to tell you about now. <clears throat> so this is a paper by um, Guido Brandt and Wolfgang Hock and colleagues that was done in uh, Germany and in Adelaide again, uh, with uh, Alan centrally involved which was an amazing ancient DNA study of mitochondrial DNA of a succession of about 300 samples from nine different archeological cultures, all from one region of Germany, um, ranging from 7,500 years ago to 3,500 years ago. So what they did in this genetic, um, we were minorly involved in this study, um, and what we developed and added to this study was a test of population continuity. So they looked at the mitochondrial types in each of these populations, and you saw is the population, is the mitochondrial type seen in each population consistent with being sampled from the other? So you remember I told you before, for mitochondrial DNA from hunter-gatherer Europeans, it was all U4, U5. And then it suddenly changed to completely different ones. That's not possible just due to genetic drift and continuity. It must be a new population coming in. So we were testing for that. And what we found was that there was a discontinuity between the hunter-gatherers and the first farming culture that we had data from, the linear band ceramic, and that that discontinuity persisted for the next five archaeological cultures all the way from the linear band ceramic, next six, up to the Berenberg culture over here, with no evidence that was strong of discontinuity, indicating that once the farmers came in, there's no strong evidence of discontinuity in the data that we saw here. But suddenly with this group, the corded ware, bang, there's a lot of discontinuity uh, to the earlier farming culture, suggesting a new group might have come in at around this time, which is about 4,500 years ago. So the next thing we did is to look at nuclear data, and this is work that we began to do in our own lab, uh, again in collaboration with um, uh, Wolfgang Hock in Adelaide, um, which is we adapted a technique that was developed in Leipzig uh, for capturing um, uh, modeled, in a lot of ways, like exome capture that's used in medical genetics, um, where we targeted about 360,000 positions that are variable in the genome that are also present and typed on these arrays of present day people so we could compare it. So even though the DNA sample is only maybe 1% human, when you enrich it for the human DNA at the positions of interest, you get almost entirely human DNA or largely human DNA. And it also is from the sections of the genome you care about that allow you to compare to your present day people. So when you do this analysis, it reduces the amount of sequencing you have to do per sample by about 250 fold. Um, and it makes accessible samples that um, were not accessible before. And so through this method, we were able to obtain new ancient DNA data from 69 ancient Europeans at a substantial level. Um, and it sort of this study by itself, because this technique triples the size of the whole literature of ancient DNA on a genome-wide scale and allows you to do ancient DNA work on a population scale. <clears throat> so when we combine it with the previous literature, we analyzed a data set of 94 ancient Europeans ranging from uh, 7,500 years ago to about 1,000, actually, well, much more than that, so, but mostly from about 8,000 years ago to about 1,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago. Um, we have a lot of data. Most of the samples have a lot of coverage. 
um, and they're from these locations, a, a largest group in, in Germany, a substantial group in Spain, and in Hungary, in Sweden. <clears throat> so I'm, here's the picture I've showed you again before. This is a principal components map of Europe. And now I'm going to gray out these dots so you can focus on the ancient samples, because we now have a lot of ancient samples to show. So this is the same picture. The Near East is one gradient. Europe is another gradient. And in between is these populations from the, Near, uh, from, from the Mediterranean uh, or Jewish populations that perhaps have more recent contact. Um, and if you look at where the ancient samples fall, the hunter-gatherers that we have data from uh, fall here. Here's the Western hunter-gatherers from uh, uh, Europe, like this Lashbor sample. Here's Scandinavian hunter-gatherers. They fall beyond Europe in the direction of differentiation from the Near East. Um, here's Eastern hunter-gatherers, a new population we hadn't had data from, from about 7,000 years ago, from two very geographically separated places in East European Russia um, that fall in a very different place. So the first European farmers, and we have a lot of them, all shift this way um, and fall on top of present-day Sardinians. I told you about that before with the Stuttgart sample from 7,000 years ago. This, you know, we have many more samples like that, and they look like this. So that begins 8,500 uh, years ago and 7,500 years ago in our sampling. And then the next thing that we see is that 2,000 years later, there's a left shift in this distribution. Um, and this is a significant shift with the middle Neolithic farmers, both of Spain and Germany, um, picking up ancestry from the indigenous hunter-gatherer people of Europe. So this was a big surprise for us, and it's very statistically significant. And what it indicates is that the first farmers of Europe um, were basically transplanted from the Near East and didn't mix much with the local populations. But within 2,000 years, they began mixing with the locals, probably independently, both in Spain and in uh, Germany and presumably in other places too, and the mix and the resulting population then began to come together, but there's a long delay. So migration is not accompanied by Im immediate mixture. There's social segregation um, that prevents these people from mixing for extended periods of time. The next thing that we see is that a population in the steppe uh, north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea uh, shifts this way toward the Near East from the Eastern hunter-gatherers which is evidence we think of Near Eastern ancestry mixing in in about a 50-50 proportion into the steppe. But look, Europe today is still not represented at, at 5,000 years ago um, in Europe. These people today, which is all of Europe, are not represented to, uh, there. But suddenly, after 4,500 years ago, the present-day constitution of Europe appears because this ancestry mixes with this ancestry and forms the present-day constitution of Europe. It's not necessarily the Yamnaya, but it's clearly and you can show with genetic data a formally strong statistical fit to either Yamnaya or a closely related population. So we can estimate the mixture proportion of these three types of ancestry, the yellow, the orange, which is early farmer ancestry, which uh, uh, 7,000 years ago is almost all the ancestry of these European populations. Then with the middle Neolithic, there's what we call this resurgence of hunter-gatherer ancestry, these indigenous Europeans mixing back in at about 20%, both in Spain and in the German samples we analyzed. And then bang, uh, suddenly um, uh, uh, 4,500 years ago, you have this green stuff coming in related to the Yamnaya, which, for example, in the corded ware, the first population our, in our series is 75% of the ancestry. And it could have even been more, because actually you also see some orange and blue, but that could have been picked up by steppe migrants coming east. It might not have been local German uh, farm, uh, farmer ancestry. It could have been people from Poland or the Ukraine who they mixed with on the way whose ancestry they picked up. So um, what you have is this evidence of, of, of mixture uh, of this huge new ancestral component, at least 70%, 5%, possibly all, a huge population replacement that was not anticipated. Present-day people of Europe today, especially Northern Europeans, are about half-step ancestry. So this is a major impact, and in some populations of Europe is the major component of European ancestry today. You might ask why this number is greater than the ancient North Eurasian ancestry I mentioned before, and that's because ancient North Eurasian ancestry is only about a quarter of this green stuff. It's just a marker die for this green stuff, which is, in fact, a larger ancestral contribution. So the summary of this is that there are two major migrations into Europe documented in the last 10,000 years by genetic data. Migration one is uh, around 6,500 years ago. Near Eastern farmers largely replaced the previous populations of Central Europe, and we have early Spanish farmers also get replaced. <clears throat> and migration two is about 4,500 years ago, a massive replacement uh, from the steppe 
uh, into uh, Central Europe that gives rise in a long-term contribution to the people in Europe today. And Europe today is a mixture of these three ancestral components and different uh, contributions is a pretty good fit to the data. Each case, this initial migration is followed by a remixing of the local people with the new migrants coming in over time. So the conclusion to the second part is that the ancient DNA data is important actually in an ongoing debate. So there was an argument that um, after the arrival of farming in Europe, there could not have been a new major migration into Europe because once a large demographic base was established in Europe, how could you have a um, new major population being able to establish itself? So that was the strongest argument in favor of the Anatolian Neolithic hypothesis for languages, uh, uh, the Indo-European languages having to had to come in uh, 8,500 years ago with farming into Europe, but the genetic data say that's not true. There's a later major migration. So this levels the playing field between the Anatolian and other hypotheses. Um, the first culture in our sequence uh, that has this ancestry is the Corded Ware, who've been linked archaeologically to the steppe and the Amnaya, although this is controversial. Um, the Corded Ware are almost certainly spoken Indo-European language. It's too late for them to have come there and not spoken in Indo-European language by most people's calculations and suggests that the current languages of parts of Northern Europe that are Indo-European, like Balto-Slavic, maybe Germanic, are probably derived from Corded Ware, perhaps other languages as well. But the Indo-European problem is not solved. We didn't say anything about India and Iran. Um, and in fact, uh, data I haven't shown you indicates that the Yamnai and the other steppe populations we've analyzed are not a valid source for the West Eurasian related ancestry in India. They have all of the samples we've ever looked at have ancestry that's not present in India. And so they could not have migrated in that form into India. So I think it's an open question where these, how these languages spread into, uh, into all the parts where they're spoken today. But we think that there's a major impact later and it likely was the vector for at least some of these languages spreading. So thanks. I think I made time and have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. across Eurasia today, um, and now we've found a sample that's not homogeneous, are we going to find more variability in Neanderthal ancestry? That's perhaps one rephrasing your question. First answer to the question is that, in fact, there's not homogeneity in, your, in Neanderthal ancestry. There's a little bit more in East Asia than in Europe today, which I actually think is likely to be due to the basal Eurasians, probably, who didn't have as much Neanderthal ancestry and diluted out in Europe. Um, but um, it's surely the case that right after the Neanderthal mixture, there were individuals with more Neanderthal ancestry because, like, someone who's parent as Neanderthal will have half Neanderthal ancestry. So we've caught someone very close to the mixture, so it's almost tautological that there must have been some people like that. The Yusti Shim sample from 45,000 years ago that was published last year um, by Xiaomei Fu and people in Leipzig and I was involved again, that sample probably actually has more Neanderthal ancestry than any other sample we've ever seen except for Moasset. Um, and so I think that early on there's more and more chance to have variability in the proportion of Neanderthal ancestry and perhaps a combination of natural selection or extinction of populations or homogenization perhaps made it more difficult to detect the variability. But, but there actually still is variability because East Asians and Europeans have just graded. Are any of these population movements related to climate changes or any kind of event? So I'm not an expert in climate change and population movements. Um, the, uh, at 39,000 years ago in Europe, there's a massive volcanic eruption and there's a cold snap that lasts about 1,000 years. Uh, some people call it the Campanian Ignorite 
And there's a lot of debate about whether the uh, beginning of the Aurignacian period in early modern humans with a particular culture is initiated by that, and maybe the demise of the Neanderthals is hastened by that. And so one possibility is that uh, Awas is a pre um, campaigning enigma right sample, and, uh, and uh, the uh, Kostenki is a post the Campanian and the right sample, and that's what you're actually seeing. You're seeing a kind of loss of populations and replacement by new migrants, but I don't, we don't have a strong opinion about whether that's the case. There's these profound climatic events that are occurring over this period. There's the ice age in between all these events. Um, you know, and the whole northern Europe is under a big glacier, so uh, these are profound events and uh, they, they correlate uh, either a, a lot with some of these uh, observations. So we've looked quite hard at the Basque data. We were hoping to see significant differences in the balance of these three ancestral components in the Basque than in the other populations. And the differences are not statistically significant. So um, however, it's tempting to fit, but, but they do tend to have a non-significant trend of a reduction in step ancestry. Um, and it's tempting to think that what you're actually seeing, as in the Sardinians, is a population that uh, speaks a language related to the language spoken by first farmers in Europe. Um, and that those populations were later run over by later events. Um, but there are little pockets of people who spoke those languages. But that would be an example, you know, if you believe the Anatolian Neolithic hypothesis, those people would be speaking Indo-European, but the Basque language is not Indo-European. If you go back 15, 2,500 years into Europe, the um, written record records many non-Indo-European languages. And they, many of them have gone extinct, but um, Minoan, the language of Crete, is a non-Indo-European language. Etruscan in Italy is a non-Indo-European language. Uh, possibly Tartessian and uh, Iberian in Spain are non-Indo-European languages. There's various languages inscribed in stelae that are readable with scripts that are clearly not indo european from their syntax where they've been decoded. Um, and so what you're actually seeing, even in the historical period where we have writing, is the rapid collapse of non-Indo-European languages in, Indi in, in Europe. And uh, in the historical period, we can still see that. We're left with almost none today. All we have left is Basque, and in Northeast Europe, Finno-Ugrian languages, which are probably a more recent phenomenon due to movements from uh, the East. Thank you.